Welcome and good afternoon. Please be seated. It is my pleasure and honor as Dean of Yale Divinity School to welcome you to the 316th year of Yale University and the 196th year of Yale Divinity School. The Divinity School embraces Berkeley Divinity School, celebrating its 164th year and 47th year at Yale, the Institute of Sacred Music in its 45th year at Yale, and Andover Newton Seminary in its 211th year and second year, and I might add now as a permanent part of this community here at Yale. Whether you are here, whether you are here or if you're seated in Niebuhr in an overflow, or if you're watching via live stream online, we extend our warmest welcome to you at the beginning of this academic year. New students have been here for just about one week and international students for a little more than one week. A special group of students have worked very hard to welcome you to this new academic year. We changed the format of before the fall orientation, double entendre intended, uh, and made it a com combined effort between school and students. But the students are indispensable. So if you were part of the BTFO team, would you please stand and let us recognize you? Thank you very much. We want to join these students and the staff that have welcomed 154 new students to YDS. 73 of you are MAR students, 63 MDivs, 18 STMs, 7 are exchange students, and 6 are PhD fellows. 24 of you plan to affiliate with Berkeley, 17 with Andover Newton, and 13 with ISM. You're a diverse group in multiple ways. 25% of you come from underrepresented groups in the U.S. 12% come from abroad. Your age range extends from 21 to 72. Some of us are really cheering for that latter group. <laughs> You represent more than 47 different Christian traditions, and 17 of you come from non-Christian traditions. Many of you already hold advanced degrees from Masters of Arts or Science, about 25 of you, to PhDs, about three of you, or on the professional side, from a professional degree of one sort or another, Another to a JD or an MD. We welcome you. You join an outstanding group of returning students who are passionately committed to the community that we know as YDS. We hope that you will all experience a commitment to faith that nurtures your soul, a challenge of intellectual rigor that stretches your minds, and an ecumenical and interfaith community that offers you the warmth of genuine human friendship. After hiring 19 new faculty in 2015 to 16, we are not welcoming any new faculty this year. <laughs> We're still recovering. <laughs> but we did promote and renew 
a number of faculty last year that because of the rain, we didn't have a chance to really properly honor at commencement, and I want to recognize. Three faculty earned tenure last year, and as I call your name, would you please stand? They are now part of the permanent faculty of YDS. Vasilius Marinas, Associate Professor of Christian Art and Architecture. <laughs> Chloe Starr, Associate Professor of Asian Christianity and Theology. and Tisa Winger, Associate Professor of American Religious History. They, the, the applause is wonderful, but compared to what they've achieved, uh, it, it, it's hard to really put it in perspective. So we congratulate them. Three other faculty were promoted to positions along the way towards a tenure decision. Will you hold your applause till I call all three and then let's give them a warm round of applause. Uh, they are Lynn Tonstad, who was promoted from assistant to associate professor. Benjamin Valentin, who was promoted from a visiting professor to associate professor of Latino A, Christianity, and Michael Beth Dinkler, who was renewed as an assistant professor of New Testament. Congratulations to all of you. There's one more whom I'll mention in just a moment. I also want to recognize some distinguished visitors, at least I think they're here, but I haven't actually put my eye, there they are, right over here. Uh, we have visiting with us the advisory, the pastoral advisory committee of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, and these include a former member of our faculty, several very famous alums. Uh, they're all distinguished ministers in their tradition. Would you just please stand up so we can recognize you? There are two women whom I traditionally recognize, and it would be wrong of me not to recognize them. Emily Bakemeyer is Deputy Provost and the Dean of Faculty Affairs in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and for many years, extending well back prior to my deanship, she has been a liaison and a real advocate for the Divinity School in the Provost Office. Emily, we thank you for joining us today, and we're very grateful. <laughs> Last, but in my heart, first, <clears throat> is someone who doesn't have any official standing, but who devotes a large part of her life to this school and who tolerates my routine absence. Uh, this is the woman whose heart I carry in my heart, Adrian. Our tradition is to use convocation as a type of hazing ceremony. <laughs> so we always invite newly appointed faculty. Sometimes they get by for a couple of years before we draft them in uh, to take a leading role in this ceremony. And this year is no exception. We're very fortunate to have them and the student council president as well. Our speaker is one of those faculty. Professor Christian Wyman has divided his career 
into academic appointments in the first part of his career, followed by a major professional appointment until we persuaded him to rejoin the academic ranks. Early in his career, he served the faculties of Stanford University, Lynchburg, Northwestern University, and then spent a decade as the editor of Poetry Magazine. And if you know anything about poetry, you know what that means. That's the leading uh, journal for poetry in this country. He is a prolific author, of, has six collection of poems, and edited another three. Once in the West, published in 2014, was selected as one of the 10 best books for that year by the New York Times Book Review. I personally have found every riven thing from 2010 to be an exceptional and powerful collection. Chris is not only a superb wordsmith, he is an authentic human being whose honest evaluation of life and faith is refreshing. He expresses his reflections in lyric art that combines simple elegance with provocative candor. He is also an accomplished prose writer and has published two books. His My Bright Abyss is, in my judgment, the most important autobiographical account of someone coming to faith since C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy. You need not take my word for the quality of his work. Many of you already know it firsthand. But he's won 18 major awards, 11 for his poetry, four for My Bright Abyss alone, the prose book. We are absolutely pleased that he left Poetry Magazine to join our faculty and I'm thrilled, and I know you will be, that he has agreed to deliver our comments today. I now invite Martin Copenhaver, the president of Andover Newton Theological Seminary, it still exists in Massachusetts, and the dean of Andover Newton Seminary here uh, at Yale, to open our year by turning all of us to the God whom we seek and serve. And I ask Martin, if he would, to remember the people of Houston in that region who are suffering not only the loss of property, but of lives. We have 65 alums living in the larger Houston area. Our hearts and prayers extend to them and to all the people who are struggling with Harvey and the aftermath. Martin, would you lead us in prayer? Please join me in prayer. Oh God, as we come to you, our hearts and minds turn to those who have been affected by Harvey. As so often in these days, our hearts and minds have turned to them. And so we come to you with a, a great sense of urgency that you might be in those places where we cannot be to the give the gifts that we are powerless to give. And so we ask that you might give peace and comfort and strength to those who have been affected and to those who seek to serve them. And may we find our own ways to be an expression of your love to those whose lives have been so severely affected. And God, we invite you to hear these silent prayers of our hearts. And now, God, we ask that you would hear us as we pray for those gathered here, because here we are, God. Such as we are, here we are. Some who believe, some who disbelieve, some who half believe, and others who don't know what to believe, but here we are. Some know exactly why they are here. 
Others don't have more than a hint of why they are here, and still others wonder how on earth or by heaven they ended up here. But here we are. Some of us are Baptist, others are Catholic or Methodist or Lutheran or Evangelical or Pentecostal or Episcopalian or Presbyterian, Unitarian or whatever Atarian or none of the above. But here we are. By whatever means we have come, by following a path as straight as a clothesline, or by holding on for dear life through more loop-de-loops than a carnival ride, by routes that are clear or untraceable, with the support or the resistance or the bewilderment of those who love us. And yet here we are. However we got here and by whatever means, thank you for bringing us here and bundling us together in this place, in this time. As we stand at the threshold of this new year, as we stand at the threshold of only you know what, we ask for your blessing. We long for your blessing. Calm our hearts in the ways they need to be calmed. Stir our hearts in the ways they need to be stirred. Open and inspire our minds that we might become learned, skilled, and wise. Then fashion us in such a way that we who are made in your image might bear more of a family resemblance and that we in some way might advance your realm in the needful, hurting, waiting world. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. The word of God for the people of God. The Place Where We Are Right by Yehuda Amihai. From the place where we are right, Flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole 
a plow. And a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Welcome, everyone. When Dean Sterling contacted me in early August about giving this address, not only did I happen to be reading George Marsden's biography of the great 18th century minister and theologian Jonathan Edwards, who was, of course, both a student and a tutor at Yale, but I happened to have paused at precisely the moment when Edwards himself was about to address the student body. I was flattered by the association, and it occurred to me that many of you students might be as well. To be admitted into a place with so much august history, so much intellectual curiosity and attainment, so many great names, it's worth a moment of pride. But maybe just one moment. In the last chapter of Marsden's book, I came across a quote from Ezra Stiles, who was president of Yale when Edwards died. In another generation, said old Ezra, the works of Jonathan Edwards will pass into as transient notice, perhaps scarce above oblivion. <laughs> and when posterity occasionally comes across them in the rubbish of libraries, the rare characters who may read and be pleased with them will be looked upon as singular and whimsical. <laughs> the pride of accomplishment, the humility of being you. If you take away nothing else from what I say today, take that. There's a real tension in the 18th century between divine grace and human reason. Grace is absolutely beyond all human capacity. One thinker after another, like Edwards, will tell you, just as they begin to furiously reason their way toward it. The idolatry of logic, and it does sometimes seem like that, led to some miraculous discoveries, like Isaac Newton's. And it led to some pretty strange Nostradamus-like noodlings in the margins of the Book of Revelations, as thinkers tried to pin down the exact date of the inevitable apocalypse. Newton himself engaged in this activity, as did Jonathan Edwards. In preparing for that talk at Yale, in fact, he read over and over the verse from Revelation 16, which says, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and told himself, that what that hail was, was his own remorseless rhetoric, which he would unleash, in Latin, <laughs> upon any antichrist, that is, Anglicans, <laughs> who happened to be in the audience. I have no hailstones for you today. I have no Latin, and I have no answers. What I have instead are two things. The first is a man from Nazareth, well known for his oratorical skills, but nevertheless, at a crucial moment in his ministry, remaining silent and writing in the dust. It is a very strange moment, and one of my very favorite moments in the New Testament. I'll come back to that. The second thing is another form of writing in the sand, you might say, and it's actually three things, three poems by the great modern Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. You've already heard the first one, but it can't hurt to hear poems twice. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard, but doubt and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. A whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. 
by which is meant, I think, that even though our human pride might wreak its havoc upon our houses, there might, if we have the proper humility, arise a living whisper out of the ashes, something resuscitating and revitalizing, something close, perhaps, to a still, small voice. Now, Marquand Chapel at Yale Divinity School is a pretty safe space for this poem. It requires no great courage for me to stand up here and celebrate its spirit of productive doubt. But I must admit, I do hear the skeletal chuckle of Jonathan Edwards in the corner over there, whose ambition, after all, was to be God's trumpet. You can make an idolatry of doubt, you know. You can become so comfortable with God's absence and distance that eventually your own unknowingness gives you a big, fat, apophatic hug. <laughs> One could argue that when doubt becomes the path of least resistance, it becomes the very thing that a faithful person must most resist. And resistance is often a matter of language. Here is Amakai again. The precision of pain and the blurriness of joy. I'm thinking how precise people are when they describe their pain in a doctor's office. Even those who haven't learned to read and write are precise. This one's a throbbing pain. That one's a wrenching pain. This one gnaws. That one burns. This is a sharp pain. And that a dull one, right here, precisely here. Yes, yes. Joy blurs everything. I've heard people say after a night of love and feasting, it was great, I was in seventh heaven. Even the spaceman who floated in outer space, tethered to a spaceship, could say only, great, wonderful, I have no words. the blurriness of joy and the precision of pain. I want to describe with a sharp pain's precision happiness and blurry joy. I learn to speak among the pains. There is much to say about the essential truth at the heart of this poem. Why is it that we have such various and discriminating language for our pains, but become such hapless generalizers for our joys? Why is it that some of us have become so much more adept at describing God's absence than we have God's presence? The end of the poem offers one key. I learn to speak among the pains, the poet says. Well, among the pains is where we all learn to speak. The instant the link between word and world appears, so does the rift between them. I met a Czech scholar once, a man of immense learning and multiple languages, who told me that he didn't speak a single word until he was five years old. When I expressed astonishment, he shrugged and said, everything was okay until then. In the beginning was the Word, goes the famous opening of John, and I believe it with my whole soul, precisely because the words that we have used ever since are at once so graced with and so haunted by that original inspiration. Now think of that moment when Jesus writes in the sand in John 8. The Pharisees have come to him in the temple courts with a woman accused of adultery. They ask what they should do with her, given that Mosaic law demanded her death. It's a trap. If he says stone her, he's breaking Roman law. If he says don't stone her, he's setting himself above Jewish law. Either way, he's in trouble. It's a trap. Instead of answering, Jesus bends down and writes in the dust. When they persist in outrage, I think we can safely assume, because think of how irritating that would be. 
He says his famous line, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, and then he bends down and he writes in the dust again. What does he write? That's the first place the mind goes, isn't it? It's certainly the direction a lot of sermons take. <laughs> it's worth pointing out, though, that some scholars question whether Jesus could even write at all. I'm not going to wade into that. But if he couldn't write, what was he doing down there? Doodling? That seems ridiculous and incompatible with the figure of Jesus presented everywhere else in the Gospels. Let's say he could write for the sake of argument then. What was he writing? Well, some say he was writing down the names of the accusers. For others, it was the sins of the accusers. I have even read someone suggest that he was writing down very specific verses from the Old Testament. There is some scriptural and historical evidence for at least the first two speculations. But I have to say that to this lay person, all three seem to me about as likely and as consistent with Jesus' character as doodling. So how to read this passage, which, by the way, is probably not even part of the original gospel, since one thing that scholars do agree on in this instance is that this anecdote of Jesus writing in the sand was added later. This is a job for a poet. <laughs> or perhaps more accurately, a job for those who know how to read poetry. Because this scene, I would suggest, operates as a kind of poem. It is meant to be experienced, not dissected or filled in. It is suspended between the literal and the metaphorical, myth and witness. Consider the mythic elements. First, there's the act itself of writing in the dust surrounded by inquisitors. Who does that? Just try that with some of your disputatious friends in the quad tomorrow. <laughs> then, too, Jesus writes with his finger, not an implement of some kind. The word, capital W, inscribes the word, lowercase, upon reality itself, reenacting, I would argue, and perhaps salvaging that original moment when the word of God became the word of man. Also, it is metaphorically suggestive that he writes on the earth, not on a tablet, as if the law had come alive, as if the closed world of human religion represented by the Pharisees had been blown open and shown to be as transient and perishable, but also as immediate and meaningful as this glorious earth that is all around us. I learned to speak among the pains Amakai said of himself, but also of all of us. Jesus says, I come to speak away your pains. On the other hand, consider the documentary details of the scene. We know exactly how the crowd was arranged and the order in which the Pharisees departed. We know that the woman was not simply accused of adultery, but caught in the act. Then there's the fact that this act of writing in the dust actually does feel like something that the unlikely, unpredictable, and often decidedly unhuggable Jesus would do. It has the feel of a witnessed event, whether or not it was true. The great American modernist Marianne Moore once described the successful poem as containing imaginary gardens with real toads in them. The phrase is apt for this scene from John as well. It is one of those moments we come to again and again in the Gospels, whether it's with a parable whose message is either opaque or so transparently obvious that it amounts to another kind of Cohen, or the silence after Pilate's question, what is truth, which you can still hear two millennia later, or in this moment when Jesus writes something that you will never read, never understand, and thus maybe, just maybe, never forget. 
The Australian poet and devout Catholic, Les Murray, has a poem called Poetry and Religion. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's one part that reads as follows. And God is the poetry caught in any religion. Caught, not imprisoned. Caught as in a mirror that he attracted, being in the world as poetry is in the poem, a law against its closure. God is the poetry caught in any religion, a law against its closure. God is in the world as poetry is in the poem, a law against its closure. Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Walt Whitman famously asks in Song of Myself, by which he means, of course, that that very pride of understanding is just another form of ignorance. And ignorance is not at all the same as productive unknowingness. Have you felt so proud to know the meaning of Scripture, the right kind of theology? to know what it is that you believe, or even perhaps that you don't believe, well, perhaps you have forgotten the law against closure. By all means, let us declare our faiths. Let us be God's trumpets. Because in that first Amakai poem, it is not only doubts that dig up the yard and restore the ruined house, but love as well. And love is decidedly active and declares itself. But let us also keep in mind the ineluctable law against closure, the poetry that is reality. After all, nothing sets a person so much out of the devil's reach as humility, said Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> One last poem by Amachai. It's a late poem from his last book, and it seems to me a pretty good summation of all I've been talking about, the tension between pride and humility, law and love, pain and joy, speech and silence. Amakai was raised an Orthodox Jew, and his poetry is filled with references to the Torah and passionate and, I think, entirely credible invocations of sacred experience but he was quite clear about not being religious. Actually, what he said was that he never went through a crisis of faith. He simply became bored with it all. The ritual, the pieties, the rabbis writing down sins in big books, the closure. In any event, I don't mean to conscript him into some kind of faith that is specifically religious. What I do want to do, though, and what I think is entirely fair, is to link his poetic enterprise with that moment in which Jesus writes in the sand. This is the last section of a long poem that seems to me to have the perfect title for a convocation address. I foretell the days of yore. I foretell the days of yore. Listen closely and you can hear echoes not only of the Old Testament in this poem, but the New Testament as well. Now after many years of living, I began to see that I rebelled only a little. And I do observe all the laws and commandments. I observe the law of gravity, that is the law of the earth's attraction with all my body and with all my might and with all my love. I observe the law of equilibrium and the law of the conservation of matter, my body and my body, my soul and my soul, my body and my soul. I abhor a vacuum in my pain and in my joy I follow the law of water seeking its own level. Past and future are recycled back to me. I rise and I raise with the law of the lever. I begin to understand, as I would with an old car, what makes it work. 
the action of pistons and brakes, reward and punishment, be fruitful and multiply, forget and remember, bolts and springs, fast and slow, and the laws of history. Thus spake the years of my life unto the days of my life, thus spake my soul unto the parts of my body. This is a sermon in the synagogue. This is a eulogy for the dead. This is burial and this is resurrection. Thus spake the man. Amen. It took three tries to get him to this podium, but it was worth the wait. Thank you very much, Chris. In just a minute, Adam Idol will dismiss us with a benediction, and then we will have uh, a procession. I ask that you allow the faculty, please, to process out first before you leave so we can get rid of these warmers. Uh, and then we will join all of you in a reception, so all you need to do is exit to the right, and this is appropriate, quite biblical, the last will be first, uh, those standing will have, will be first in line, so, but please allow, if you would, the faculty to exit before you exit. Adam, would you please dismiss us in a word of prayer? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. So now may this same God fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. For from him and through him, and to him are all things. Therefore, beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. <laughs>